Hello, Journey. So good to see you. Happy Labor Day weekend. We're so glad to have you here on this uh, Sunday of Labor Day weekend. We want to welcome you. We want to welcome those at our uh, Lake County campus. We're so glad to have those folks joining us at Lake County always. And uh, we want to welcome those that are joining us online from all over the place. We have a special guest that's going to be with us. I think, I think she's going to be here at the 1115 service. But someone that's been online with us almost from the beginning. And every week she's in the chat letting us know, encouraging. Her name is Pelsey. And she puts Pelsey from Boogie Down Bronx. <laughs> so she's from the Bronx, New York. And she flew in just to be at worship this weekend and uh, to connect. So isn't that awesome? And so uh, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. And yes, that video of Back to School Bash, your eyes did not deceive you. There was a slam dunk contest right here. Right here in that Back to School Bash. And I'm a little hurt that they didn't ask me to participate. I'm a little hurt about that. But actually, my knee's been bothering me and... Uh, I, I just thought, you know, if it had been a free throw shooting contest, I'd have smoked them. I'd have smoked them. Hey, we're wrapping up a series today that we've been calling What Kind of Church? And we've been looking at the new that Jesus unleashed on the world. So over the past few weeks, we've seen that Jesus inaugurated a new movement that would be totally unstoppable. Jesus promised, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He installed a new covenant that was entirely effectual. And what I mean by that is Jesus was the Passover to end all Passovers. He was the priest to end all priests. He was the temple to end all temples. And he was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Jesus instilled a new ethic that was radically personal. He said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And today we're going to see that Jesus introduced a new scoreboard that was surprisingly prayerful. And for us to better understand the win, W-I-N, that Jesus had in mind, we have to hear the prayer that was closest to his heart. Now, if you grew up in church, you know what a prayer request is. You're sitting in a circle. You're about to finish your small group, maybe a class. And the leader asks, does anybody have a prayer request? And some will say, yes, pray for my sick grandma. Pray that I can find a job. Pray for my rebellious son or daughter. Pray for my lost son-in-law. Pray for fill in the blank. An old preacher years ago told me about a woman who shared this incredibly troubling and traumatic prayer request for a couple I mean, it was terrible what was happening in this particular family. Come to find out, she was asking for prayers for her favorite characters in a daytime soap opera. <laughs> Imagine sitting in a small group with Jesus. And someone says, does anybody have a prayer request? And Jesus raises his hand. He said, yes, I have a request. Now, wouldn't you like to know what Jesus prayed for when Jesus prayed? I know I would. A New Testament writer named John writes about it in the 17th chapter of his book about Jesus. Some have called this chapter the real Lord's Prayer. You see, the prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer was really a model prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It's really the disciples' prayer. But what we're about to read in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John is the real prayer of our Lord. Now, let me describe the setting. Jesus has almost reached the very end of his time on earth. In just a few short hours, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be crucified. And everything moves really quick after that. But before all that happens, he spends some time praying and he has a special prayer request. Now, before we dive into what Jesus prayed for, let me ask you, what do you pray for? My guess is you pray for the same things I tend to pray for, meaning we tend to pray for what's most important to us. 
Therefore, our prayer, most of our prayers revolve around, well, us and the people who mean the most to us. If you want to know what's most important to you, look at your credit card statements in your calendar. That'll tell you. Or pay attention to what you get most excited talking about. Just listen. I was at the gym yesterday where I work out, and I listened to three different people talk enthusiastically for several minutes about their favorite wine. What time of day they like to drink their favorite wine and what they like to drink with their favorite wine. I mean, they were wine evangelists. <laughs> now, personally, I'm more interested in the guy that turned the water into wine, but that's just me. If you want to know what was most important to Jesus, listen to his prayers. I have a hunch I could be totally wrong, but my hunch is virtually none of us who consider ourselves serious followers of Jesus have ever asked God for what Jesus asked God for here. Virtually none of us have ever prayed the prayer that Jesus prayed, even though it was so clearly close to his heart and so important to him that in these final precious hours, it's the primary thing that he prayed for. The one thing Jesus prayed for us is the one thing very few of us pray for at all, which indicates what's most important to Jesus is not always what's most important to us. So let's look at how his prayer started. John 17, Father, the hour has come. Up until this time, Jesus has said on more than one occasion, my hour has not yet come. He said that right after his mother uh, uh, talked to him about the wine situation at the wedding, and he said, my hour's not yet come, Mom. And he told this to his brothers who wanted him to show up at one of the major Jewish feasts and just announce he was the Messiah. He said, my hour has not yet come, brothers. He understood the timing of God's plan of redemption. He had steadfastly moved toward this time when he would be the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, but he never tried to force it. He never tried to hurry it along. But now he says, it's here, Father. It's go time. For three and a half years, I've been walking around with these guys. I've been trying to explain what you're like. I've been trying to explain what the kingdom of God is like. I've seen some soaring breakthroughs with him. I've seen some souring breakdowns. But here we are at the hour that would change everything. And he says this, glorify your son. In other words, Jesus said, Father, would you just light me up and would you lift me up in a way that people will ultimately recognize who I am, your one and only son who does exactly and completely and only what the Father wants. Now listen, here's the interesting thing about the hour where Jesus will be glorified that he's referring to here. Here it is. The hour in which God was most glorified, we would have been most horrified. The hour in which God was most glorified, we would have been most horrified. The moment we would have looked away, God never looked better because the hour of Jesus' deepest agony was precisely the moment of his decisive victory. Speaking of himself, he continues, for you granted him authority over all people. Now, we talked about this some last week, but this is another reminder that Jesus knows who he is and what he can do. God has granted him authority over all people, all events. He could call the shots. Heck, he could even call off the shots. He knew he was about to take the following day if he wanted. And yet he knows if he chooses to win by earthly standards, we lose our eternal standing. And so he continues, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And then Jesus defines eternal life. And you'll notice there's no mention here of a heaven that we'll go to sometime later, but rather a relationship that exists between the Father and Son right now. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And then he points to this shared communal work that he and the Father had been working on together, not only throughout Jesus' ministry, but for eternity. Look at what he says. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work 
you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you when? Before the world began. What began? Whatever it is Jesus and the Father have been working on, they've been working on it a long time. And what exactly was that work? Is the work of reconciling the world in all of its complexity to God through Jesus in all of his beauty. To reveal what the Father was like to a handful of followers who would in turn distribute that knowledge to the world starting in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the world. And what Jesus says next, most of us don't know as much about as we should, but it's been hiding in plain sight right in front of us the whole time. Here's Jesus' prayer request to the Father just before all hell broke loose, and I mean that literally. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me so that, in other words, here's the purpose of the protection. Here's specifically how I want you to protect them. Now, the interesting thing is he's already given these guys some pretty bleak news about their future. He's told them on more than one occasion, okay, guys, here's what your future looks like. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be handed over to authorities. You're going to be betrayed by your families. You're going to be beaten unjustly. Some of you are going to be killed. I'm not going to lie. You're going to face some serious trouble in this world, but take heart. I've overcome the world, and that may not sound like much of a recruiting pitch to me and you, but these guys were all in. And yet here he is praying that God would protect them, not necessarily for their physical protection. He's praying for protection from something else, something that he thinks is even more important than their physical survival and from something that he knows is more of a threat to the mission he was entrusting them. And here it is. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be, everybody say that, one as we are what? One. You see, at the very end, Jesus was most concerned about his followers' unity and their oneness. Because here's what he knew, and here's what he's going to say in the next few verses. He knew that as long as they were bound together in his name and on mission, the world will change. But if they ever got divided and splintered, things will get uglier and nastier and more chaotic than you can even imagine. Skipping down to verse 20, he prays, and my prayer is not for them alone, them being the apostles, the original guys. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those. Who are those? Those being us, those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, that next generation of disciples after them and that next generation of disciples and the next generation of disciples leading all the way up to us today. My prayer for them, Jesus says, is my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them, in the first century, all of them meant Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, the slaves and free, male and female, Roman military leaders and soldiers and those under the rule of Roman military leaders and soldiers, of tax collectors and those from whom taxes were collected, the educated and the uneducated, all of them. All of them in the 21st century means Republicans and Democrats, independents and the indecisive, libertarians and librarians, the black, the brown, the white, the beige, the single, the married, the divorced, the remarried, you, me, in other words, all of us. And what does Jesus pray for all of us? I pray that all of them may be, say it again, one. one. That sounds laughable right about now, right? That sounds laughable in our deeply divided world. And yet Jesus was convinced it was not only possible, it was absolutely imperative. Unity was not a nice little add-on for Jesus. This was not some, wouldn't it be great if they could all just get along wish now listen, our oneness in Jesus was mission critical for Jesus. Our oneness in Jesus was mission critical for Jesus. It's one for the win. In fact, one is the win. But here's a sad and sobering reality that we need to acknowledge. 
The church in America is not winning as Jesus defined winning because we've decided something else is more important than our oneness. We're more focused on winning victory at the polls than we are guarding unity in the pews. We're more outraged about the outcome of political races in our nation than we are engaged with carrying out the missional mandate of our king to the nations. For many in the church, their passion for their preferred political party or candidate far exceeds their devotion to kingdom priorities to the point that people will leave a church over perceived political differences rather than actual theological distinctions. And what I mean by that is that most churches today aren't splitting and dividing over doctrinal issues like they once did because, quite frankly, most people in most churches don't know, don't know enough about doctrine to divide over it. But they will email you and blast you on social media and curse you and cancel you if you don't totally align with their political point of view. And whenever Christians take a political view that trashes a living, breathing you for whom Jesus died, then we've missed the message of this final prayer and we undermine the mission for which he died. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we can and we ought to do better. As Wheaton College professor Ed Stetzer asserts, you can't hate people and engage them with the gospel at the same time. You can't war with people and show them the love of Jesus. You can't be both outraged and on mission. Now, here's what I think, as if I hadn't just already told you what I think. I think the overwhelming majority of Americans would agree with this statement. See if you agree with it. Nearly everything today is unnecessarily politicized and toxically polarized. I think the majority of us would agree with that. Nearly everything today is unnecessarily politicized and toxically polarized. I'm going to give you an example. Take a look at this picture. Now, unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last 30 years, you know who that is. Who is that? That's Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks, the country music artist. One of the most popular entertainers in our nation. The best-selling solo artist of all time. And I mean not just in country music, but in all genres of music. Brooks is a native of Oklahoma. He's a graduate of Oklahoma State University. He's probably the most famous alum from that school. The second most famous alum from that school would probably be a football player named Barry Sanders. Sanders was all-American at OSU, at Oklahoma State, and he was an all-pro running back for the woefully bad Detroit Lions from 1989 to 1998. Barry Sanders is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. So when Garth Brooks did a concert in 2019 in Detroit at Ford Field to honor his fellow OSU alum, he wore a Barry Sanders jersey. But as soon as he appeared on stage, social media blew up and the wrath of political trolls was unleashed on Brooks. I don't come to a concert to hear about your politics. I will never buy another one of your records. You see, they thought he was promoting Bernie Sanders, <laughs> the senator from Vermont who was running for the Democratic nomination for president at the time. It seems like so many people have lost their minds over politics. And when Christians are among the loudest voices of the lunacy, the church loses respect and influence. And that's what Jesus saw coming. And that's what concerned him most. And so he continues his prayer. He says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that, in other words... He's about to tell us why he prayed for our oneness. And this is going to be a shocker to some of us, but the real reason Jesus prayed for oneness for us really doesn't even have to do totally with us. He prayed for oneness because of what he wanted to do through us. Let's look at what he says. He says, the reason I want them to be one, and, uh, to be one is so that the world, no, not the people in the church, but that the people outside the church, the people outside of faith, the people that drive by buildings like this and the one at Lake County and roll their eyes. Maybe say something not so nice about us under their breath. It's not just for us alone Jesus is praying this prayer. It is for them that Jesus is praying this prayer so that the world may believe you sent me. You see, while it is true the kingdom of God is not of this world, it's also true it is for this world. 
And when the world can see our overwhelming unity, in spite of our obvious diversity within the church and between churches, they may actually be convinced that God sent Jesus. That's why our unity in Jesus isn't a little, let's all play nice, add on. Our oneness in Jesus was mission critical for Jesus. We are to be winsome so that we might win some. Watch this. Jesus prays that we will practice such unity in the body of Christ that people will believe in the identity of Christ. Jesus prays that people will believe that God actually loves them because they see our love for each other. People are one to Christ when they see his disciples are one in Christ. Can you imagine a world? Imagine this world where people are skeptical of what we believe, but they're envious of how well we treat one another. Imagine that world, a world where unbelievers were eager to hire, vote for, work with, work for, live next door to Christians because of how well we treated one another and how well we treated them. Friends, it happened once before in a world that was just as violent and just as divided and just as polarized as ours, if not more. And I believe it can happen again because through Jesus, anything's possible. Bottom line, our unity preaches. And not only does our unity preach, it preaches louder than our doctrines, louder than our slogans, louder than our mission or vision statements, louder than our programs, louder than our social media pages, unity preaches the way the world is going to set up and take notice of this beautiful, diverse thing that we call the local church is when the church works together and is unified, even though we disagree and agree to disagree, even though we've been raised in such different ways, we'll never see the world the same way politically or culturally or sociologically or in any other ways. And yet at the same time, there's this beautiful, noticeable, notable, and distinct unity that we have in Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm telling y'all, this is the way forward for my new covenant people, my ecclesia. This is what will eventually get the attention of the empire. There's never been anything like what I'm starting. And you don't even have to make it up. I've modeled this for you. I've already told you what to do. In fact, it's the only new command I gave you. Remember this from last Sunday. Jesus gave them one command earlier in the evening. He said, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And again, even Jesus' command is not about us. He's telling them the reason I want you to love each other. It's not just so you get along, but because by this, by this kind of unique, sacrificial, lay my life down kind of love for one another, even though you're not like one another, by this unique kind of love for each other, the world will know that there is a God who loves them, a Savior who died for them, and a Spirit who will empower them to do this. Now listen. We can debate what it looks like to love others the way Jesus loved us, but we don't get to decide whether to love others the way Jesus loved us. That's already been decided for us. That's been modeled for us, and that's been prescribed for us. We love one another as I've loved you, Jesus said. So now just hours after he's given them this one new command, Jesus is pleading for them in prayer. Father, please help them to get this right. Please help them with this, Father. As this thing grows and goes from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth and different countries and different cultures and different languages and different political systems, please help them to love each other as different as they're going to be in so many ways. Back to John 17. He says, I've, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete Unity, not a complete ecclesiastical organizational unity, not a complete governmental political unity, not a superficial cultural unity, not a paranormal transcendental kumbaya spiritual unity, but a complete unity of purpose, a unity of a worldview centered on a God that loves us, a savior that dies for us and a spirit that indwells us. That that reality would be so compellingly clear in us, it would radically redefine everything about us. And then look what he says. 
And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. He was saying, Heavenly Father, you and I know that if they get it right in their unity in me, not around their politics, not around their culture, not around their language, not around bits and pieces of doctrinal positions about how they sing and when they sing or what day they meet on or what time of day or how they do communion or what translation of the scriptures they use, but a core belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only Savior of the world and Lord of life. If they can unite around that one encapsulating truth, then the world's going to change and there's nothing that can come out of the gates of hell that will stop it. Now, anybody remember the movie Gladiator? Love that movie. One of my favorite movies of all time. It's a story of the Roman general Maximus, who through a terrible twist of events goes from celebrated warrior and favorite of one emperor to despised traitor and nemesis of another emperor. He first becomes a fugitive, then a cage slave, then an undefeated gladiator. His growing fame in the arena ultimately brings him to the sports pinnacle, the magnificent Colosseum in Rome. The games open with the reenactment of the Battle of Carthage. The gladiators, all foot soldiers, are cast as the hapless Carthaginians. It's a stage set for their slaughter. They're marched out of a dark passageway into brilliant sunlight, and they're met with the roar of a bloodthirsty crowd. Maximus, now the leader of the gladiators, shouts to his men, stay together. And he assembles them in a tight circle in the center of the arena, back to back, shields aloft, spears pointed outward. And he shouts, whatever comes out of these gates, we will have a better chance of survival if we work together. If we stay together, we survive. But friends, Jesus, our master and king, promised us something even better than survival. Jesus promised us not only we will survive whatever comes out of the gates of hell, he said his church, his ecclesia, will thrive and advance against the gates of hell. Nothing can hold back Jesus' church when it's working right and when it's working together. And here's the amazing thing. After the resurrection of Jesus, this actually happened. After the resurrection of Jesus, the apostles went into the streets of Jerusalem, and clearly they went with one purpose, and their purpose was to make disciples of Jesus from all nations. And they went with one message, the message that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the king that's come to reverse the curse of sin, to usher in a new order of things. He's come to bring the kingdom of God to earth, and then he laid down his life unlike any other earthly king, and he rose again. So... I have a pastoral plea that I would like to close with. As our nation is wrapping up the political primaries and heading to another bitterly contentious general election later this fall, your favorite political candidate or preferred political party will win or lose an election based on how American citizens voted on a designated day. If Jesus doesn't come again before 2024, and that would be great if he would, well, amen? amen? Same thing's gonna happen all over again. Candidates will eventually be put forth. Political parties from both sides will tell you everything you hold dear in this world is at stake. And one of them will win, and one of them will lose. The church will win or lose influence based on our behavior, regardless of the outcome. The church wins or loses. The community wins or loses. In many ways, our nation wins or loses based on how we as followers of Jesus love God, love people, and serve our world, regardless of the outcome of the upcoming election and the next election after that and the election after that. Friends, the future of the eternal church of Jesus Christ does not depend on the outcome of an election in a country that's only been around 246 years. The future of the church does not depend on the future of any nation because the mission of Jesus wasn't to save a nation, but to heal the nations. Friends, there is no nation or party that can bring about the future for which we long. 
The future of the church was determined 2,000 years ago when the King of kings and Lord of lords rose triumphantly over the grave and declared, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus doesn't need us to win anything in his name because he's already won it. And if the New Testament gospels and letters are correct, he will win it again. So, listen carefully. Why in the world would we opt for anything less than that? Why would we desperately seek the power of the state when we've already been sent the power of the Holy Spirit? Why in the world would we allow ourselves to be divided over things that can't begin to compare with that? Why would we as followers of an eternal king allow ourselves to be divided by temporary political systems and temporary political leaders and temporary political platforms. Why would we listen to the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the hands and the feet of Jesus, allow ourselves to be baited into debates and divided over questions about which we all have opinions informed by partial information at best and almost always presented from a biased point of view. Why would we allow any political point of view, a view that, by the way, you might change your mind about someday, a view that you might totally abandon in the future, why would we allow any strongly held or even not so strongly held political view divide us from a living, breathing you that is created in God's image, redeemed by God's Son, and empowered by God's Spirit? And if we want to fight for something, why would we not fight for, struggle for, and sacrifice for the unity our King prayed for and then died for? So there's a couple of things I want to do as we wrap up this series. The first is a prayer request. Would you pray like Jesus prayed? Because most of us have never prayed a prayer like this before. Would you pray for oneness in the church, Big C Church, and in this church? I'm going to give you a little prayer. It goes like this. Heavenly Father, make us one in Jesus so that we can influence many in the world. Everybody say it with me, Lake County online. Everybody, let's read this together. Heavenly Father, make us one in Jesus so that we can influence many in the world. Now, some of you may think that plea for unity in Christ is naive. I'll tell you what's naive. A young Jewish rabbi from Nowheresville, Nazareth, surrounded by 12 even younger guys standing in front of a pagan stronghold in the Roman Empire, making this outrageous promise. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That's naive. But he did, and it didn't, and here we are. I had a guy ask me last Sunday. He asked me if I was afraid for what is happening in our country. I'm not fearful. I'm hopeful. Because my hope is tethered to a resurrection in the past and to a return in the future. And my mission is to invite all people to surrender to the reign of God. And I will never give to a person, a party, or a platform what belongs only to God. I love my country, but I love the kingdom of God more. And my first allegiance is to Jesus Christ, who's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And listen, you don't have to look like me, think like me, act like me, vote like me. Heck, you don't even have to like me to follow Jesus with me. So would you pray, Heavenly Father, make us one in Jesus so that we can influence many in the world. This is the prayer, the final prayer our Savior offered. And then he died to make that happen. This is what he wanted protected even more than the lives of his closest earthly first century followers. So one more time, let's say it it out loud with me. Heavenly Father, Make us one in Jesus so that we can influence many in the world. Here's the second thing I want to do as we wrap up. I want to remind you. I want to remind you. Or I want to invite you to consider what happens when we declare our allegiance to King Jesus by being baptized. We said earlier that our unity preaches. Here's what I believe. Nothing preaches unity like baptism. You say, where'd you come up with that? I didn't. Paul did. He wrote, so in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Gentile, 
neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. This statement is far more scandalous than we can ever understand in the 21st century. Paul was calling people out of their old identities and their deeply embedded cultural categories to adopt something entirely new. And baptism was the gateway into that newness. Think about it. Baptism is the church's public rebuke of racism. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. It's our public repudiation of classism. There's neither slave nor free. It's our public rejection of sexism, nor is there male and female. And it's our public renunciation of any form of partisanism, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul is not saying that there's no longer people of color, or there's no more social structures, or no more genders, or no more religious or political differences. He is saying that what unites us in Jesus is greater than anything in the world that would divide us. Baptism is the greatest proclaimer of our union with Jesus and our unity in Jesus. Again, Paul wrote this in another letter. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been, what, united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And I just wanna to say to you, if you have been baptized, many of us have, would you remember what your baptism represents? And if you haven't been baptized yet, baptized into Christ, we offer you that opportunity right now, both at Apopka and our Lake County campus. So, one more time. What kind of church are we? We are a Jesus following, disciple making, grace receiving, grace giving church that Jesus promised that his resurrection makes a reality, that is known by our love for one another and unity in Jesus' name for his glory. That's what kind of church we are, amen? Let's stand together. Would you stand right now? Lake County, stand with me. So Father, we, we thank you for this prayer. And I will confess, I've not prayed this prayer nearly as much as I should. I've not prayed about unity as much as I should have. It's so easy for me to get all powered up and fired up over my own opinions that I have. God, forgive me for not coming to you and saying, Father, would you make us one in Jesus so that we can influence many in our world? Lord Jesus, that's what you prayed for before you went to the cross, and then you died for that reality to happen. So I pray for that, Father. I pray that that would be what Journey Christian Church is known for. That kind of church. People may not agree with our doctrinal views or statements, some of our beliefs, but I pray they'll be envious of how we treat each other and how we treat them. Lord, make us that kind of people. And when we're one in you, we pray, Father, that many will be one to you. In Jesus' name we pray. We all agreed and said,